We'll give everybody about two more minutes just to get settled with their lunches. Yeah. Okay. Okay, what do you think? Yeah, all right. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Barbara Slavin. I direct the Future of Iran Initiative here at the Atlantic Council. And I'm really delighted to, to see you all here uh, today. From the very beginning of, of an Iran program at the Atlantic Council about seven years ago, one of the things that we've always focused on uh, has been people-to-people -people ties with Iran. Four years ago, we put out a major study with policy recommendations for the US government on Iran. And one of the key elements of this was to enhance the opportunity for people-to-people -people ties with Iran. That report came out before we had a joint comprehensive plan of action. It's true no matter what happens to the nuclear deal. Uh, as you know, the U.S. government is reviewing its Iran policy, but it is our profound hope that whatever happens, they will preserve these very, very important exchange agreements. Today, we are going to focus on science exchanges with Iran. But of course, this is only one slice, uh, albeit a very important slice, of the entire uh, picture. Our interactions with the Iranians, particularly since about 1998, uh, some even a little earlier, have focused on sports diplomacy, interfaith dialogue, women's entrepreneurship, music, the arts, medicine, legal exchanges. The State Department's International Visitor Leadership Program has played a big role in this since 2006 when our, that program was uh, revived for Iran. Um, and there are also a large number of Iranians studying in the United States, still, I believe, about 12,000, although obviously some recent policy decisions have had a, a, an impact on that. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speakers. Our keynote speaker today is someone I'm absolutely delighted will actually be on a, uh, up speaking for us. He's been usually sitting in the audience quietly at our events, but he's one of the pivotal people in this area. Glenn Schweitzer. Glenn directs the Office for Central Europe and Eurasia at the National Academies in Washington. He basically invented science diplomacy. He was the first science officer at the US Embassy in Moscow from 1963 to 1966. And he was very involved after the fall of the old Soviet Union in programs to uh, help uh, Soviet weapon scientists find more useful things to do. In 1999, he began uh, developing relationships with Iran during the Hatami period. Uh, and he has been at it ever since. He has a new book which has just come out today. You can purchase it today online. He will tell you how. It's called U.S.-Iran Engagement in Science, Engineering, and Health, 2010 to 2016, A Resilient Program but an Uncertain Future. Our next speaker will be David Leyland, another dear friend of our program who has extensive personal ties and experience in rural Iran, both before and after the 1979 revolution. David is also unique in that he's the rare American who can still get visas to go to Iran. It's not easy these days. <laughs> um, but I think it's because of the area in which he works, which is uh, water conservation, uh, sorry, wetland conservation and water management practices. Some of you may remember that it was just a year ago that we had uh, a, the debut of a film, a documentary film on the Hamoun wetlands, just a year ago, uh, and what could be done to help save them. This, uh, this was David who helped bring this filmmaker here, who helped get the film uh, done, and he continues his work on the Hamouns and other areas involving uh, water conservation, wetlands, climate change, and Iran. And finally, another of my very favorite people, uh, John Limbert. John is class of 1955 professor of Middle Eastern Studies at the US Naval Academy. He had a 34-year career in the US Foreign Service, which was capped off by serving uh, as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern, parentheses, Iranian affairs. Um, he was a guest of the Ayatollah for 444 days during the hostage crisis. 
Uh, he remains one of our premier analysts of all things Iranians, and I think he understands better than most uh, the bureaucratic and political obstacles to a closer U.S.-Iran relationship. So I'm going to turn the podium over to Glenn Schweitzer, who will show you a PowerPoint, which summarizes the findings of his very important new book. Uh, thank you, Barbara. It's an honor to be here with you. You're a pioneer in, in improving relations with Iran, and we look to you for your continued leadership. Uh, let me thank some of the people in the audience who have worked hard with me over the years. And so while I'm speaking on behalf of myself, my support team is here, and only, through, only because of them could I be making comments. So what I plan to do is to make a, show a few PowerPoints, maybe five or six, but devote most of my time to, to talking in a little more detail what we've been doing uh, what the, and what is the future. And I hope this, uh, this session will come up with some good ideas where should we be going in the future, taking into account all the opportunities and constraints surrounding us. So let me start with my, uh, and one, one other comment. Uh, Barbara said you can get, get my book uh, off the internet if you pay the price. It's free. All you deal is, this is a preliminary copy. We're going to have a hardback in three weeks, but if you want the, the full text, minus a few copy edits, all you go is to nap.edu, nap.edu, and you can download it free of charge. And uh, then when the hard, hard copy comes out, just con in about three or four weeks, hard, uh, uh, con contact me and I'll sell you one free of charge. I'm not in the commercial business. Okay, so the first slide, uh, the first cover, we have three pictures there which reflect uh, our interests over the years, you see a seismograph, and it was the, the ba a BAM earthquake that uh, ignited our most successful program. And since that time, thanks with, our for our, uh, with the help of our colleagues at UC Berkeley, we've had a series of activities, and we now have on the internet, thanks to the Berkeley people, uh, seismic data going back decades that the Iranians had kept in their file drawers and never, get, never exposed to anyone, but now it's on the internet thanks to that, those efforts. I also have there a picture of the solar panels. The Iranians have come to us in the past and said, can't we cooperate in this area? It, it's been a tough, tough uh, uh, battle with the, uh, with, with the uh, government, but nevertheless, we have had uh, some cooperation, and that's the basis for their 30 megawatt uh, solar farm, which is going operational right now. The final, the final uh, uh, photo there is of Lake Ormia, and I don't need to tell this crowd about Lake Ormia, and that there was, it's one of 120 salt-laden lakes around the world, four of them in the, are in the United States, and we are learning a lot uh, uh, what you do about saline lakes uh, from our experience in Ormia, and our friends right now, primarily from, salt, from Utah State University, uh, are are on the case. And let me just make one, when I'm talking about our program, you'll see in the next one, I'm not talking about the people in Washington, the number of people in Washington, is, it's one, but we have people all over the country helping us. We are sort of the broker, and you can see the numbers there. Uh, we've had that many participants in our program uh, directly involved since the last 15 years, that's a sort of a good number, from a lot of different places. And then we had an equal number, 1,500. These are the people who facilitate the exchanges, who spend an hour or two with the groups when they come, who uh, somehow get it, listen to the lectures or whatever. And uh, they are very important people too. So the numbers we've involved we think are quite impressive. We have a, one statue there, that's Nobel laureate Joe, uh, uh, Joe Taylor from Princeton. He went to, he went to uh, Tehran. They took him out to parties. Uh, Techno Park took his, took his photograph and built a statue in his honor, and there he is. The other picture you see, uh, a, a, uh, a workshop at, in, at Shar Sharif on earthquake, uh, earthquake issues, and there you see a couple hundred people who are attended, and the interesting thing, look who are in the front row, women. Three years earlier, we took a picture like that, there were no women, but now there were, there, 
maybe 15, 20% of the women are, come out from the back rooms. They would sit in the back room in a special place where they wouldn't be seen, but, not, but then they've now come front and center, at least in our programs. Uh, well, we've had 32 workshops, about a third in Iran, a third in uh, the United States, a third in third countries, and here are just a couple of the venues. Uh, they, they speak for themselves. The, the uh, uh, Center for the Encyclopedia in Tehran is quite an exciting place to visit. Hope, hopefully some of you have been there. But we say workshops, we're talking about not just sitting down for three days and talking, it's very important. And we're not talking just about putting out books like this, and we have about 25 of them. You want to tell you a serious science book, look at that. So when people go, they, they come back and write a two-page page, uh, trip report. We have things like this, and the, and the editor of this book, who did it free of charge for us, is sitting right in this audience. And I'll, I'll put that up to any scientific conference you want to convene about, seismo, about uh, resilient cities, talk about a, t a topic, and that'll match anyone you, anyone you can find, in the, any book you can find in the, in the US. And, the, and you'll see, uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, okay, I'll come back to that. Let me go, let me go now to the, the site visits. Uh, they speak for themselves. When we have a workshop, it's a workshop plus, as I said. Uh, the Iranians come here. We try to arrange for them to visit various places around the country, ending up with a workshop. Americans go there. They also go around and see things. And here are just some examples of places we've been there. If, if I could have found all the photos, I could have six or eight slides like that. But the, I think you get the idea. Uh, here are some uh, Iran facilities of, of interest. Uh, the, the, the ones on the left are coming online. The synchrotron is pretty well constructed. It's, it'll be operational pretty, uh, hopefully in a year or two. The telescope is, is, is an idea. It's a well-developed idea. The, it's, it's waiting for money, as all things are. But I think the Iranians are so determined, sooner or later they'll have that telescope there. And it's well positioned to link into the other telescopes around the world. I, find out that, I found out that the value of telescopes is where it's, where it's located relative to other telescopes in the world, and particularly if you can get them sort of on the same uh, latitude, you're, pretty, you're in pretty good shape, as this, I'm told, is in an excellent position. The other two on the left there, the Pasteur Institute, that's interesting. The French are very clever. They invested in, in Iran. They invested their name, not a nickel, or not, not a real. So the Pasteur Institute has the name, a French name on it. It's self-sustaining, self but with the, with the name, it has all sorts of prestige. It gets all sorts of grants. And one interesting story there is when I visited that, uh, I, they, they, had, they showed me some, some samples they were analyzing. They were samples of rodents, and I said, what are you doing? They said, we're looking for rabies. Where are you looking for rabies? Oh, the US Army sent, the, the US Army sent that to us from Iraq. They didn't have any way to analyze it over there, so they sent it here and said, would you check these out to see if we have a rabies problem where our troops are operating? So that's not bad news. <laughs> uh, that was a few years ago. And then on the bottom one, you see one of the, you see one of the uh, strange looking uh, research centers, but it is really kind of interesting. Uh, unexpectedly, uh, a, a group I was with were taken there, we were dropped off there, didn't, didn't know anything about it, walked in, they said, oh, look what we're doing, great. Uh, I get back to Washington and I tell people, hey, we were at this center. They said, oh, we thought that was some kind of a, a, a classified operation run by the Cubans. Well, you know, you gotta be there. <laughs> uh, impact gets, gets me back to my report, our reports. We're trying to impact on science. Now, if we have impact on other things, that's good too, but our, our goal, goal is to cooperate with science if you do, if you, if you do, can have good science collections, diplomacy will follow easily. But we're not, go, we're not going there to, to build bridges in the first instance. If our people who go there don't learn something, we try not to send, aren't going to learn something, we don't send them. So uh, uh, we, think of, we think of this a, a, win, a, a win for the United States. That's why we're involving Iran, not because we are good politicians and we think we know how to solve the problems. We, we know the Iranians are good and we want their, their knowledge out there with the rest of the world so we can benefit. Uh, on, the, on the picture on, the, on, the, on the, the, my left on the bottom, uh, it turns out that the, uh, 
science and technology gurus of working level gurus, maybe not, from minister on down, not the above the minister, but from minister on down, they have meetings around the country from time to time, and they talk about the United States a, a lot of, at those meetings, and this is the uh, meeting last year in Keish Island, of their gurus meeting. To, and of course, we deal with the Department of State, uh, I guess for two reasons. One, uh, we want to know if we're going to have any problems as we go forward, and two, we like to share ideas of what's happening in, in Iran, and uh, I think we're kind of a wel we're welcome there because we get insights uh, that we're not focused on intelligence type stuff, you know. But, but every once in a while you find out something, my God, somebody might be interested in that. It might have some relevance to what we're trying to do. So uh, we're, we're, we, we try to share our information. They know a lot of things about science going on there too. And so that's, that, those are our, among our audiences. But the most important impact we're looking for is this. This shows you the dramatic growth in Iranian publications in the recent years. Now, forget the, forget the little red business. The little red business, that part is, they didn't, they didn't know whether to include in their publications letters, uh, memos, and so scrape those, scrape those away. The green are all legitimate publications. International, this is internationally recognized publications and so forth. And the, the, now, one of the reasons for, one of the reasons for that skyrocketing is, is the, is the international connections, because these are all IS, what they call ISI journals, and the more the Iranians put out about what they're doing, the better for us, the better for the world. And about 22% of those publications in recent years are co-authored with foreigners. Another 22%, 8% of those are with the Americans, and they're, we're out, out in front of that, on the international scale. So finally, I'm gonna stop showing PowerPoints and just make a few comments against these topics. As I mentioned, we emphasize science. Before we undertake an effort, whether it be a trip there or a trip here, we sort of say, now is this a topic where the Iranians really have something to bring to the party? And the answer is surprisingly often yes. And if our, our specialists think they have something to bring to the party scientifically, okay, that's a go. Secondly, do we think we can get scientists from both sides of the ocean who will contribute to moving that science ball forward? And we spend a fair amount of time about that. And uh, we, uh, we uh, like, before we support visas, for example, we like to see who's, who's, who's coming. And uh, we, we don't want any, uh, uh, we, we insist that when people come here, they are from Iran, they're prepared to give a presentation here. So we say we have 15, 12 or 14 people come over for a, a visit. We want them to bring with them 12 to 14 abstracts of what they're gonna say. And we tell them we want, to, we want to publish those in the book I showed you. Similarly with the Americans, before they go there, before they co we participate here, we want to know what you're going to say because we're not going to waste our time on putting together people who don't contribute to the advancement of science. And so we are very picky about that subject. So someone asks us, hey, will you, take, will, will you help us sponsor a tour of Iran to Look at the forest, and the answer to that is, well, what are we going to learn about the insects to eat the leaves, or what are we going to learn about? And so we are, we are particular in that area. We don't do exchanges for the sake of the exchanges. Obstacles. Now, one thing you will find in, in my, my report is a chronology of events of OFAC. Uh, we, as you can imagine, we have, over the years, dealt with OFAC. I have received 17 OFAC licenses. Uh, and every, every, every year now, they get more difficult and difficult. And most recently, my experience in getting a response from OFAC was, was uh, 20 months from the time I submitted the license till I had a response. And the response was, we need more information. Uh, so things are going downhill with OFAC. Also, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the principal the vice OFAC has to control science is, are we providing a service? The word service is the magic word for us. The word service was introduced about oh, 30 years ago when we had uh, uh, regulations to, to, to prevent uh, companies from offering services in, in the oil and, gas, oil and gas area. So it's clear, consulting services 
sort of are like selling equipment. So, but then they started, someone started saying, well, services, how about, how about science? And that got tricky, tricky. Well, up until about three years ago, it was sort of interpreted, if you're offering training as a service, even if it's a training of how you detect earthquakes, that's a service. Well, we had difficulty with that, but getting that overturned was not easy when it was already in about 20 regulations. And then, uh, so we're okay there. And now it's expanding into going to conferences, and we have a real problem with that. But they haven't, they haven't embodied that yet in, in regulations, and we're going to try to s stop that if we can. I don't know how we're going to do it except make noise. But to suggest that an that a American uh, professor going to a conference on, let's say, uh, a forest blight is providing a service to Iran is sort of beyond my comprehension. Uh, so that, that is a, a major, major issue right now. On the travel warnings, uh, every time the State Department puts out a travel warning, it gets uh, more, uh, more detailed. For example, if you look at the tra travel warning that came out three weeks ago, it, it listed all the groups, all the groups, minority groups in Iran who were being subjected to uh, human rights abuses or whatever. I just had a little difficulty relating uh, the, the travel of, of particularly of, a, of, of, any, of any American to, to Iran uh, who, was going to be, who was going to be affected by the minority rights in some province of, of Iran. There, uh, first, the minorities aren't that very big, but anyway, I thought that was a stretch, but you know, the State Department says it, we, we uh, oblige. It's, it's just, I, it just makes it more difficult. So more and more to go to Iran requires a license. And then you face the six month wait, 12 month wait, tw in our case, 20 month waits, and it, it's difficult. And then of course, the financial sponsors. Um, this, is a, this, is a, this is a tough one. For some reason, the, well, for good reasons, the foundations have focused on the nuclear issue. So if you're working on uh, JCPOA and looking for money, that's, that's easier than if you're trying to promote exchanges. In the, in the uh, about 10 years ago, a couple foundations said, we'll take a flyer in this. And as a matter of fact, the old Alton Jones Foundation, I don't know if you any remember that, they put us in business because of something new, but after one time, uh, grant, then they were out of it. Carnegie said, we'll try it one time, one time grant, they're out of it. Even uh, Plowshare said one time, so, but the, all the one times are done now because everybody's focusing on the JCPOA and, and other you know, important issues, you know, the missile issue is important and all that sort, sort of thing. And so as of right now, to find money is really a very difficult problem. Now we've tried to off, operate on a, on a minuscule budget. Now, what, what, what we have been able to do is con the universities into putting, doing some of the heavy lifting for free of charge for us. And I, I have one of, my, one of our victims here with us, and they've, they've really responded well. They said, well, if we can get uh, the, your name on the, on the, on the report, we, we like that, that's, that's important for us. And so we, that's, that's the trade-off. They can use our name if they do the heavy lifting on doing all the staff work. But it's, it's a real problem, and uh, we'll, we've, we will, we'll continue to, to struggle with it, but uh, I don't see government funding coming along to, uh, to uh, universities and NGOs and whatever very quickly. Now, there ha ha has been a little bit of work, progress in that area, which is now being considered and so forth, but that's an important, cons but it, overall, uh, I feel somehow we can solve the financial problem if the people have the will to go, go out go ahead with it. Finally, uh, one final comment before I turn, this, turn the podium over to someone else. Oh, by the way, uh, in, the, in the book, you will see chronicled all the exchanges we've done. We have a exchange by exchange commentary there. We had, a, we, had a work, we had a workshop on mathematics. It spells out what the people did, what they learned, and how it made a difference. We tried each of them to introduce what did we learn particularly from the Iranians that we didn't know about in the past, and you'll see a lot of that in, the, in, in, in this document. Finally, now looking forward, and I have putting at the bottom to rem remind you we focus on science, that's the original trace from the Bama earthquake. That's the original tr tremor 
we have there at the bottom. So that means think science, uh, policy is important, but we're up front, our science keeps us up front. So how important are people to people exchanges? And that's sort of a, a judgment call. And we really don't have any way to quantify that except with that chart on international publications going up. But how important is it to the, to the science community? We have lots of ideas in the, in the report. We have ideas on, on solar decathlons, on, on innovation boot camps, and all the other things people talk about, which the Iranians have suggested to us. Uh, we have ideas on general licenses. So if you want to work on a medical issue, no matter what it is, you don't have to go to OFAC. You already got the general license. There are two general licenses out there. One is environmental conservation. And my friend David will, knows about that one. And we have one on wildlife. How I got in there, it's a mystery. But I think it was through, through David's contacts with the, <laughs> he can talk about that, but they're in there. So, but we, uh, and there are general licenses if you want to work on human rights issues, but you know, uh, we, we leave that up, up to other people who know more about that business than we do and who maybe are a little bolder than we are. But we, we do think, we, we do have to make a decision. My institution has to make a decision are we going to hang in there over the long run? If we do, how can we strengthen? We're, we're working with the Iranian-American uh, diaspora now, and we'll continue that track. But hopefully, by the end of the year, I have to report to, to the presence of my academies, why are we in this business? And if I can't demonstrate that there's something in it, in it for U.S. science, other than you know, not just getting People, having people on the payroll, but you know something in science is, and there are a lot of other there are a lot of other comp, lot of, lots of competition for the funds we have access to. I'm going to have a tough time, but we'll we'll give it our best shot. So let me start to stop there, uh, Barbara, and let my friend David take over. I wear hearing aids, and so I can hear well, but that means I speak softly. Of course, I don't carry a big stick, <laughs> but I hope that you all can hear me in the back. A little louder. A <laughs> little louder, yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Well, thank you. Barbara Slavin is a journalist and the acting director of the Atlantic Council of Future of Iran Initiative has made tremendous contributions to portraying an objective picture of today's Iran. Congratulations for the promotion to director. <laughs> John Lindbergh is a remarkable diplomat and Iran expert. I'm honored to be on the panel with him. He became my hero the day that he commented on my having been censured by a government official because I took a group of visiting Iranian academics to a halal dinner at the 16th Street Jewish Center. This man said to me, and I quote, we question your judgment. Aren't you familiar with the situation between Iran and Israel? And I mentioned this to John, and his answer was, Khariyat ekhtiyaj be alat khordan navare which loosely translates into, you don't need to eat grass to be a donkey. <laughs> <laughs> it's a special honor to join Glenn here. He's done an incredible job of organizing and implementing these many scientific exchange programs with Iran. It required great dexterity and perseverance. He's highly respected and trusted by the Iranian government and academic circles in Iran. Unfortunately, his work has not received the commensurate support in this country. If this valuable work is to conti continue, NAS requires an expanded budget that, among other things, provides for a full-time administrative assistant, much less an understudy who could persevere 
if Glenn ever decides to retire. Well, I've been asked to be brief, so here goes. I've been associated with Iran and Iranians since 1946. I have Iranian family, I had Iranian partners during the 15 years I lived there. Before the revolution and during the past 10 years, I've traveled extensively and often throughout Iran, especially to the more remote and wild areas. I've been invited to spend three weeks next month in Iran, visiting a number of different sites that are earmarked for ecological restoration programs. My work is non-political and pro bono. I don't have to do what a boss tells me to do. Basically, I try to facilitate and encourage better relationships between Americans and Iranians interested in Iran's ecological challenges, working with a broad range of government institutional and private sector contacts. I also try to facilitate and promote certain programs that are designed to address specific ecological issues. Before the revolution, Iran had a population of 40 million people. The Hyrcanian forest in the Elburz Mountains, the scrub oaks forest of the Zagros, rangelands, arable lands, wetlands, surface and groundwater, and wildlife conservation were in good shape. I recall times in the wetlands which were full of water when the sky was darkened with the clouds of migrating waterfowl. The populations in the protected areas, parks, were so great that they had to be culled. Now, the population has grown to 80 million. The forests have been decimated. The wetlands are almost all dry. Arable lands have been overtilled, leading to dust storms. Rangelands have been overgrazed, and you now have influx of thistles, which are taking over the rangelands. And rain water turns to floods because of the lack of ground cover. The wildlife parks have been hammered. Surface water has been mismanaged. Groundwater has been abused to the point where in places like Kerman, where grow pistachios and bam, where you had date forests, it's sometimes difficult to plant or to grow because of the saline nature of the water. Of course, many other countries have the same problem. In the United States, you know, we're reminded of the Colorado River, the Salton Sea, Lake Mono, the Great Salt Lake, and Owens Lake, among others for those of you who are familiar with that. Two projects with which I'm specifically involved, one deals with the Hamun wetlands of Seistan in eastern Iran. My father prepared and helped negotiate for Iran what's known as the 1973 Helmand River Treaty. This provides for sharing of the Helmand River water between Afghanistan and Iran. The Helmand is called Hirman when it enters Iran and used to empty into large wetlands called Hamuns. The area covered was more than 1,500 square miles and supported an extensive civilization dating back to 3000 BC. Now the Hamuns are dry and the civilization is dead. Some 650,000 people are known to have fled the desiccation and the fierce resulting sands and dust storms which impact already tense relationships with Afghanistan and, and, and Pakistan as well. Working with a well-known filmmaker, Mahmoud Essani, UN agencies, various government and private sector friends, documentary film called Once a Hamun was made and distributed, as shown here, as Barbara said. First showing was at the Atlantic Council, then at the World Bank, 
extensively inside Iran via national television and at a number of international film festivals. Very shortly, it will be shown in Tehran to an exclusive group of very senior Iranian government officials. Before the Hamoun documentary was made, news articles about Iranian wetland challenges mostly referred to Lake Urmiya. Now they also include the Hamoun crisis. What's more, the government has completed and signed a comprehensive plan to restore the Hamouns. Work is scheduled to begin soon, inshallah. Khuzestan. Khuzestan is a province in southwest Iran that borders on Iraq and the Persian Gulf. It's especially important because of its strategic location, petroleum reserves, and agriculture and water resources. Due to a number of circumstances, its land and water resources are severely challenged, resulting in many problems. With a grant from a private Iranian bank, we recently started work on a more professional documentary film than that for the Hamuns. A well-known environmental scientist, Kaveh Madani, has agreed to be the scientific advisor. This film will not only portray the nature and extent of the challenges, but also suggest potential avenues to address them. All of this, of course, we're doing in cooperation with Ministries of Agriculture, Ministry of Energy, the Department of the Environment, and UNDP, United States, United Nations Development Program. The Iranian government leads most countries in the Middle East regarding progress concerning environmental sciences and is dedicated to resolving its ecological crises. In that respect, I can assure you that it wishes to cooperate with U.S. and other scientists. In July, in association with UNEP, United Nations Environmental Program, United Nations Development Program, other UN agencies, the Department of the Environment and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs held a major SDS conference, SDS Sand and Dust Storms. 36 international ministerial level delegates participated and agreed to an ambitious resolution. I was one of 11 so-called resource persons <laughs> that invited to the, this program. And in my presentation, I stated that U.S. scientists are very experienced in dealing with water resource and dust storm issues, largely because of our own experiences and the mistakes we've made in the United States, and that they were very interested in dialogue and cooperation with Iranian colleagues. After my talk, a number of Iranian ministers expressed their appreciation for my remarks and their desire to cooperate with U.S. scientists. Because of the political environment, obviously, any exchanges must be very carefully organized and implemented to meet the sensitivities of both governments. However, I am personally convinced that U.S. scientists can visit Iran if they follow pertinent regulations and protocols. Granted, this is easy for me to say as I am known to the Iranian government and know how to get permits and arrange travel. However, I'll be happy to assist any American environmental scientists who are approved by the National Academy of Sciences and the Iranian Academy. There are many European scientists that offer help to Iran, but with the exception of Spain, these countries don't have the same sort of water management issues and experience that the U.S. has. Also, Iranian scientists are most likely to speak English and are culturally comfortable with Americans. One thing I urge is that American institutions that wish to implement programs in Iran, that they go through the National Academy of Sciences. Glenn Schweitzer knows what he's doing. If you don't know what you're doing, you can get in a lot of trouble. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.
There we go. All right. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Glenn. That was fantastic. David, that was fantastic. Now I think you understand uh, how much I have learned from from these gentlemen. Uh, over the years and, and their experiences in, in dealing with Iran through ups and downs in U.S.-Iran uh, relations. Um, I am going to turn to John Limbert now just to, to give his thoughts. I mean, clearly, political obstacles have always been there. There has never been a time when these kinds of exchanges have been easy. And we have to say that as we speak, uh, we have several dual nationals who are in prison in Iran, the Namazis, uh, Namazi Sr. Bakr is 81 years old. He's a former UNICEF right. official. Uh, we have to say also that there is a young uh, scholar from Princeton who was uh, sentenced to 10 years in prison for alleged espionage because of some documents that he got for his research work. So this is never easy. It's not been easy since 1979, but it has value. So, John, with that, let me turn to you. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, thank you, Barbara. And let me first of all recognize uh, the good, the the excellent work that Barbara and Glenn and David and there's some others here in this room. I think of Ed Martin and Bill Miller and others. Uh, if I if I neglect to mention you by name, please please forgive me. But um, this is been a long slog. Um, this we, people have been doing these things now 20, over to a 20 years um, and more. And you do, if, you, if you think you're going to see um, results quickly um, or results at all, um, you're in the wrong business. This is not, this is not the place to be. Um, listening to um, Glenn's story, some of Glenn's stories, particularly about the uh, Pasteur Institute and the U.S. Army tests for rabies, um, I'm reminded of what someone told me where he said, look, in Washington, if you want to talk about Iran, there are really only two things you have to say. One is, I don't know, and the second is, it's very complicated. <laughs> and in the second, I thought, I thought of the second when I heard about the, the, ra the rabies testing at the Pasteur, Inst uh, Pasteur Institute, which makes perfect sense. Uh, and I, I was reminded of that also recently. I met a, uh, I met a gentleman uh, at a social event uh, who told me that he owned a farm in Karaj, outside of Tehran. Um, where he raised iceberg lettuce. And I asked him, I said, but nobody in Iran, people in Iran don't eat iceberg lettuce. Um, and he said, that's right. I sell the lettuce to a broker in Dubai who then sells it to the US Navy. <laughs> <laughs> so things, things are very complex, things are, are are very complicated. Uh, but to give you an idea, and also um, Glenn mentioned the, the, um, the perils of OFAC and the perils of, uh, of licensing. Um, if anything, maybe he's understated uh, what's happened. Uh, all, of, all of us have stories. Uh, uh, my, my favorite is um, about uh, a group of scientists who wanted to come here and as they were getting ready to go at the end uh, the administration decided no they cannot come here but because we have it on good uh, we have it on good authority that they are bringing weapons of math instruction <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's the environment that we work in. Now, these, uh, these programs are excellent. I mean, first of all, I'm very jealous of all the colleagues here who have been to, have been able to go to Iran. I've not been able to go to Iran now since for about 38 years. Uh, that's not my choice. That's not my choice. That's, that's not my choice. That's the choice of others. That's the choice of others. 
Um, and, but, and, but this excellent work, again, the main feature of it is persistence. Uh, a, a, a proposal gets turned down, uh, there are difficulties, a visa is denied, uh, a conference is canceled, whatever, whatever happens, but they don't give up. Uh, and that's really the secret. Uh, now, what one looks for, though, is how, is, as, as you all know, and as uh, Barbara pointed out, the political stalemate that we've been in is for now 38 years remains. Um, it maybe gets better sometimes, maybe gets a little worse, uh, but it comes and goes, but it's still there. And the question is, my, the question that I put to myself is can, what's the role of these, of these wonderful programs? Is there, a, is there, can they contribute to breaking that downward spiral that we and the Iranians have been in uh, for so long? Now, so far, they haven't. I mean, let's not fool ourselves. Uh, the relations remain pretty much where they've been, uh, uh, where they've been for 38 years. We we yell at them; they yell at us. To simplify, to uh, uh, to make it simple, we beat in our chest for 38 years, and we get uh, the results have been very sore chests. Uh, and <laughs> that doesn't mean that we stop doing it. We keep do we 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 keep doing it. Uh, so. What I'm, what I'm looking, what seems to me, uh, I, when I was back at State Department, when I was back at State Department in 2009, 2010, uh, the, all these programs were going on. The question is, can we, can they, is there some way to make this change the politics, to change the, change the stalemate? And what I was looking for was something that the, the social scientist Bill Beeman calls the advantage of the lower hand. Hmm. Um, and there's a very interesting, what I discovered was there was a very interesting program, some of you may be familiar with it, um, called the Mississippi Delta Medical Project. Um, and if you're not familiar with this, it's worth a look, it's, uh, it's worth a look because there's something there and you'll, you'll see what I mean. Just describe it briefly. As, as you know, our own Mississippi Delta is, la is last on every social indicator of health, educa uh, education, family, life expectancy, all sorts of things. People, they've tried everything. And at one point, a few years ago, they found a pro there was a pr discovered a program in Iran called the Khaneya Behvars, which is the rural health houses, and they and they said this might work. I mean, everything else we've done, nothing else we've done has worked, and so they established connections with some Iranian institution. I think including the Ministry of Health, the University of Shiraz, and others, and they brought Iranians to Mississippi. They sent people there to Iran, and it. It worked. It worked in the sense of imp imp improvement. It worked far better than anything else they had tr uh, they ha they had tried. Why did it work? I th I think it worked because we were not giving, granting, sending expertise to Iranians. That had been the pattern for too long. Um, and what happens in that case is. You, like with the best will in the world, you set up a kind of dependency. You set up a dependency relationship. Um, the, the superior's technology, the superior is giving to the inferior with his technology. And, and Glenn pointed to this. Glenn, I think, pointed to this in his, uh, um, uh, in his presentation. And I know David is also very well aware of this. Uh, now, we go to, we went, we, uh, our people went to the Iranians and said, we need your help. And what was the Iranian reaction? In the midst of a very bad political situation was, of course, of course. And one of the people in the project told me he went to uh, a small place, a, a, a 
small town near Shiraz, where they were doing some of these projects to look at what they were doing, and they were sitting in a, uh, they were sitting in a, a, a tea house, uh, and they were speaking English with their Iranian counterparts, and one of the, one of the gentlemen there uh, from the area said, who are these people? And they said, they're Americans. And he said, I thought we got rid of the Americans. <laughs> and he said, no, this is different. They're here to learn from us. And the reaction was, oh, that's different. Uh, I didn't know that the rain could fall up. <laughs> and that, to me, might, to, it seemed to me when I, when I saw this project, uh, which got very little political support, by the way, I should say. It wasn't stopped, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't quashed, but it wasn't really supported, was I said, there's something in there that could, if you could translate that to the political realm, uh, there are possibilities. There are possibilities. What I could never figure out was how to do it. Now, let me just end. If any of you here in this room can figure out how you translate that kind of project, that advantage of the lower hand, where in fact the Iranians no longer become the recipients of techno, so what do you call techno, higher technology, but in fact are, um, are those who provide the, assist, who provide the assistance on an, equal, um, on an equal basis, I think we're onto something. And I think there may be a chance because after all, we've been doing these, research, these exchanges for 20 years, and so far, the, the political environment remains just about where it's been. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, John. Before I come back to you, Glenn, I just wanted to say a couple of things. I mean, there are clear areas that have been win-win, and, and Glenn will talk about some of them in scientific terms. Our, our, our wrestlers have learned more from Iranian wrestlers, perhaps, than any other group. And if, if those of you who came to the event we had last May, we had people talking about our sports exchanges, these are definitely win-win. And, and our wrestlers will be honest and confide that they learn more from the Iranians than the Iranians do from them. Um, I have a, just a personal anecdote. My son was studying physics in college, obviously does not take after me. Um, and he was doing some research over the summer on quantum computing. And he found online from a journal an article written by an Iranian woman physicist, mathematician, on quantum computing that was so good that he cited it in his research. So, this is not a one-way street. I don't think it's been a one-way street for a long time. One other point, and that is um, when we put out this report four years ago with policy recommendations to the US government, one of the things we said about people to people is that even if it doesn't translate into political changes, changes in the, in the relations between the US and Iran immediately, it lays the foundation for improved relations at some point. Because every Iranian who has come to this country to study or to participate in one of these exchanges. Every, almost every American who has gone to Iran and participated in, in an exchange comes away with a sense of the other as human beings, just like us, you know, of a culture that deserves to be respected and understood for the sake of our own country. So whether it translates into something concrete tomorrow in terms of being able to reopen our embassy in Iran or not, I, I think it is never wasted, and, and I think we really have to keep that in mind. And I speak as someone who's gone to Iran nine times, and that's the only reason I can sit up here is because I've learned something about Iranian people during the course of those visits, namely that they don't have horns and that uh, many of them are quite delightful individuals. So these are important things to learn. Can I make a point about win-win? Sure. Uh, I know that uh, President Rouhani has popularized this phrase when he came when he came into when he was elected and he started talking about board natije board board of 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 win win outcome win win outcome. Frankly, um, a lot of people didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> because, you know, unless you studied game theory, you're not sure just what this is. And so I asked him, Ronnie, and what does board board mean what does win win mean to you? And he said, it means that you win and then you win again. 
<laughs> oh well, it has a different meaning. So we better be English. careful <laughs> when we talk about win-win outcomes. In English, they yeah. may mean different things <laughs> to different people. And if you study Iranian history, you can well understand where such an idea might come from. Indeed, indeed. So, Glenn, um, two questions to you. First, uh, if you could talk some more about the benefits that American scientists have obtained from these exchanges. Uh, well, we'll start with that, and then, and then I'll ask you one other. Well, there are two kinds of benefits. One is what you're saying, the, the long term, and reflected in scientific and publications or whatever. But I think in the political environment, you have to have some here and now. And when you, I mean, when you say that the uh, Iranian research on, uh, on uh, dengue helps our case against Zika. Okay. That, 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 that has some resonance. Uh, when you say that the Iranians are probably the world's leader in understanding stomach cancer, can stomach cancer. That, that kind of has a little ring to it too, too. And I think you can go through a whole list of, a lot of those topics are set forth in the little handout you have. So I won't try to run through them all, but uh, I, I'm, uh, in, in, the, in the last, few months, I've been very focused on how can we highlight what helps us tomorrow. Uh, and not in the abstract, you know, it, it, it helps us, uh, if, if we're looking at Chagas disease, you know, we suddenly have a new strain of research we should, our people should be following. And, uh, and, and there are a, a large number of those areas where even, even the old underground irrigation systems, I mean, the country is so I mean, they're so worried about water now. But maybe this ancient technology has a, a, a future, mm. even though it's 100 years old. And, and the whole idea of dry land agriculture, and there's no dry land in what's in, what's in uh, Iran. And, and now they're going to the desalting business. And they are spending enormous amounts of their resources on desalting technology. We think we, solve, we, know, we know how to do that. But I'll bet you they come up with all sorts of, of, of new ideas that we hadn't thought about because they're, they're thinking about it today, not 20 years ago when we, saw, we thought we solved the problem. Good. The other question I want to ask you is, uh, I understand there have been no new uh, exchanges approved by the State Department so far this year. Is that, is that correct? And what is your anticipation for, for the rest of the year? Well, I, well, I'm not the authority on what the State Department is doing. I'm, a, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any, any, uh, any uh, s financial support by the Department of State uh, for people to people. I may be wrong, but uh, I'm just not aware of it. So let me just look, uh, put close that on that. And if, looking to the future, I, I think that uh, uh, should, should, we get, should we get beyond, beyond the, the, uh, the perennial problem of is, is the JCPOA going to be sustained or not? And we can, if we can sort of get that out of the out of the head, headlines of everybody and start focusing on what, what can we do to really engage Iran or whatever, I have no doubt that the the State Department and maybe other agencies would be out there uh, breaking new grounds. For example, in some areas, Iran leads the world. Now, one area where they lead the world is we know from our, our universe is here. They produce the best electrical engineers in the world. Just ask the head of the electrical engineering department at Stanford where, the, where his best po postdocs come from. They come from Iran. And I'm sure uh, electrical engineering is a little too coupled to, to security regions, but that's just sort of, I think if you went through a lot of these tight areas, you'd come up with the same kind of conclusion that if you want to be, be with the top young people in the world, don't neglect Iran. Indeed. David, do you want to add something from your patch? What, what, what are we getting? I mean, I can see what Iran is getting in terms of working on the Hamoons or Lake or Mira or, or Huzestan. What are we getting from it that you can point to? We haven't had people in Iran since 1979. We don't understand the people. We talked to some Iran-Americans here whose English is excellent, but we don't speak Persian. And so we really don't understand what's going on in Iran. To the extent that Americans can go and socialize or do sports or uh, faith-based exchanges or 
whatever it is, everything adds up to a better understanding. And that, I think, Iran, again, it's a population of 80 million people. It's the second biggest economy in the, in the Middle East. The first is Saudi Arabia by virtue of its oil only. And if you talk to some friends and allies in the Middle East, they're, what they're most worried about are the advances that Iran is making in science and technology, sure. not the atomic bomb. So I think it behooves us to have as many contacts as possible inside Iran as much as possible. The Iranians that are here and have not gone back to the United States, back to Iran, they're not in touch with this. Yeah. I've talked too much. No, that's okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to open up now to our very distinguished audience. And uh, if you would uh, wait to be called on and say your name and uh, ask a question, please do not give a speech. Uh, gentleman right here first. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you very much. First, thank you for this fantastic panel and this unparalleled um, expertise of, of the panelists. Uh, my name is Jeff Odlum. I'm a recently retired Foreign Service officer. Um, I had the privilege of serving as an Iran watcher for the State Department in Istanbul, Turkey in 07 to 2010 and still remember fondly the visit of Ambassador Limbert, uh, back, I think back in 09. Um, one of the things we Iran watchers tried to do back then, it seems like a long time ago, but we did have some success in encouraging these, uh, 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 not only people to people, but scientific exchanges, many working through the uh, Glenn Schweitzer and many independently of that. Um, but we hit two very significant bumps in the road when uh, Ahmadinejad was reelected and it led to the protest. And then even worse, when our reporting was uploaded to WikiLeaks. And unfortunately, uh, we had a lot of names of our scientific partners in that reporting. Our mistake, but it led to a lot of them being jailed. Um, and uh, I think many years of, of, a, of a pall being cast over these exchanges. I'm, I'm happy to see that there's some momentum going again uh, on, on these non-political exchanges. but. I'm curious, the risks still remain, as Barbara mentioned, there still are significant risks for the Iranians to participate even in non-political scientific you know, um, exchanges. What safeguards uh, mm. do you try to put in place or what protections do you try to put in place to insulate your Iranian partners from any risk of uh, pressure or retribution from the Iranian government? Thank you. Uh, we do two things. One is uh, we make sure that the Iranians who were invited understand that it's going to, everything's going to be public. There's not going to be, we have, we're going to publish what you say. So they, they, they should be aware of that. Secondly, we rely on our, our uh, we, we encourage our contacts in, in uh, Iran to make sure they, they check this out with the Iranian government. We're going to have a, we're going to have a workshop. We want that not just checked out by this university or that university. We want the government to check it out. And so we ask some of our colleagues in, in Iran, hey, look, before we put this on, uh, we want to make sure that this is, the Iranian government's OK with it. Now, that, depending on what the subject is, that depends what level of OK you need. I mean, we're not asking the Supreme Leader to sign off on it. But, or, <laughs> but we're, we're, we're asking. And, and the, so I think we have to be totally open. We don't want anybody going to jail. And we, that's, that's our number one criteria. Nobody goes to jail because of us. <laughs> I can tell you that from people in Iran that every program is approved by the office of the president. Yeah, I know that when we brought uh, the documentary filmmaker here last year, uh, clearly his film had to be approved in advance, uh, you know, and, and uh, we invited uh, uh, diplomats from the Iranian uh, interest section here. I mean, I think one must be completely above board. There's nothing sneaky about any of this. This is legitimate exchange of information between two important countries. And, uh, you know, I think it, with Ahmadinejad, I, as I recall, Glenn, you once were kept in a hotel room for some hours. Was that under Ahmadinejad? Uh, just, and, uh, uh, yes, it was just before the... Uh, uh, the, second, uh, the second election, and it's documented in my first report. So. In, in, indeed, he, uh, he, uh, I didn't document he, in he, he was again. well interrogated by Iranian officials, uh, uh, security people, uh, about his activities there. So, I mean, the distrust is obvious on, on both sides, and it's something that we, that we have to live with and, and, and deal with. But yeah. the bottom line was they let me kept catch my airplane home. Yeah, if they let you get on the airplane, it's always a good sign. Uh, yes, right here. Mm -hmm. 
Hello. Thank you very much for your presentations. Uh, I'm Milton Honig, and my question is for John. You mentioned the desirability of having uh, exchanges on a diplomatic level, the same quality as uh, scientific exchanges. What about in the JCPOA? Uh, the dip <clears throat> in the negotiation of that, for instance, you had uh, contacts between two scientists at the very highest level, mm -hmm. Ernest Moniz from the department, head of the Secretary of Energy, and Salehi, the head of the AEOI. And I think this is an example of uh, the kind, the quality of the negotiation in the uh, JCPOA. Good point. Can I, can I, okay, good. Huh? Just very, just, <coughs> just very, very quickly. Uh, one of the arguments, or one of the discussions around the JCPOA, that whatever its benefits, whatever its virtues, whatever its drawbacks, uh, that it validated the process of diplomacy. Uh, that it said you can achieve a goal. Um, in our case, limiting the Iran's nuclear program by, diplom uh, um, by diplomacy. Uh, but I'm glad you mentioned, um, uh, you mentioned uh, Dr. Salehi, uh, because according to the accounts I have read, and I have no inside information on this, um, it was the relationship between him and Secretary Muniz that in fact was very often key to the success of the negotiations or the res trained at MIT, although they didn't know each other. No, they didn't. The, uh, they didn't. But it, it validates what our colleagues are saying about sure. the importance of scientists talking to each other when it's going to be more, more, more of, of course, Secretary Kerry and Foreign Minister Zarif talked a great deal to each other, but uh, as politicians, they were very, they were, they were very, lim they were very limited. I'll just give you. And this is this is a very old tradition. Uh, I just came back from a meet from a meeting of the Pugwash organization. Oh, yeah. Seventy years, uh, uh, seventy years they have been working with basically physicists to physicists. I mean, they they occasionally bring in you know allow diplomats or political scientists to to, to come in, but basically it's physicists to physicists working working this issue. Uh, uh, working this issue. And Secretary Muniz and uh, uh, Senator Nunn, Sam Nunn, were at this recent meeting. And I can just relay a comment that Sam Nunn made. Um, I hope he doesn't fault me for doing this, but he said, he said, canceling the JCPOA back in Georgia, we would say that is dumb, D-U-M, dumb. <laughs> One comment on the JCPOA, there is an Annex 3, which is civil nuclear science exchanges. Right. Now the Europeans have gone ahead and started implementing that. And so the Euro Europeans have done it, the, the EU has taken the lead and have negotiated with, with the Iranians implementation of that and they parceled out pieces. You know. Point one will be taken over by the Spaniards. Point two will be taken over by the French, so they don't cross each other. So they have a the basis for a healthy program of scientific exchanges, which are generally related to the to the JCPO, JCPOA, and in parallel they have a non-nuclear uh, non-nuclear agreement. So they're trying to cover the whole spectrum of, of of science, building off the JCPOA. The U.S. has said, has said well, you know, we have to uh, resolve the bigger issues before we worry about uh, civil, nuclear, uh, civil nuclear science. Uh, little advance uh, advertisement, by the way, on September the 25th, we have the ambassadors of France, Germany, and Britain, and the EU ambassador in Washington will all be in this space oh, talking about the JCPOA and the, and, uh, the hope that it will indeed uh, be recertified by President Trump and will continue to uh, remain in effect from the United States point of view. Gentlemen, all the way back, you were very patient. Yeah. Thank you, Barbara. I'm Majid Fani. I'm Iranian-American. I graduated uh, from University of Maryland, uh, PhD in mechanical engineering. As you mentioned about your son studying physics. Yeah. I was reminded just uh, to mention as a commemoration for if you have heard 
Professor Maria Mirzakhani. Yes, indeed. Who recently passed away at the age of 40, and she was the professor of mathematics at Stanford University, and it is a good example of this uh, cooperation of scientific uh, arena. And my question for the gentleman about the, this relation as uh, you mentioned about the trust issue. What is your recommendation to the current administration? <laughs> As you see, they have banned the seven countries and uh, in the name of terrorism, yeah. the terrorist <coughs> countries, those terrorists were coming from some countries, they were not banned. And as you see, the Iranians are banned. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, that's an easy one. Uh, I, I have been opposing the travel ban from the very beginning and all its various permutations and combinations. Um, there have been no recorded cases of Iranians who've obtained visas and even before this administration, as we know, it's very difficult for an Iranian to obtain a visa to come to this country. They have to leave Iran, go to Dubai or Istanbul or Armenia, Georgia to get the, the visa. Um, uh, there's no recorded instance of any act of terrorism being committed in this country by any of these uh, people who've come from Iran, or indeed, I believe, from the other countries that are, that are on the list. Uh, so, you know, uh, why they were chosen, uh, that I will leave to the administration to, to explain. But we, we hope, indeed, that the, they will, these visa bans will be overturned. And, uh, of course, we hope that um, we will renew this policy of engagement, you know, the people-to-people -people engagement piece of it uh, um, had started 20 years ago, but it really took off under the second George W. Bush administration. It was Condoleezza Rice who, uh, who advocated uh, using the International Visitor Leadership Program for Iran, set up the whole policy of Iran watching, right? It's, uh, sent, mm -hmm. uh, trained all these diplomats to learn Farsi and be based in countries around Iran to, to try to understand the country better since we don't have diplomatic relations with Iran. Uh, so I think this is profoundly in U.S. interest. I mean, information, knowledge, obviously, you know, this is not espionage. This is simply understanding each other. And, and I just can't think of anything more important uh, for the United States at, at this time. Uh, yeah, all the way in the back. Hello, this is Gabriele Barbati from Voice of America. Uh, for m Mr. Schweitzer, um, uh, you said that there is an increasing number of Iranian scientific publications, also code or papers. What does, do, do these numbers tell us, not only in terms of quantity, but also in terms of quality of this research and recognition of this research? And one little qualification, uh, clarification, when you said 1,500 researchers involved in exchange in the last 15 years? You mean Americans or both American and Iranians, please? Well, the second one, uh, uh, those were totals. Those were totals, both, both from both sides. And so the institutions from both sides. Uh, the, the, first, the first question? The first was about the quality. You well, mentioned well, the quantity well, of papers, but these, are they these, good? These papers wouldn't have gotten, these are all internationally certified journals. These aren't just any journal out there. These, so these are all IS, what they call ISI journals. So. Uh, you ha I think it's reasonable to think that they aren't, they may not be the highest quality, but they wouldn't get, get in a journal unless they're pretty good, because they go through peer review or whatever. And we have one expert in the audience who, who, does that, who has done that for many years, and I think he will quickly uh, uh, support the idea that we're talking about good papers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wait right here. Wait for the microphone. Right here. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> You've got them coming from both <laughs> yeah. sides. There you go. Right. Uh, Pete McDonald, uh, a U.S. Foreign Service officer. By chance, I served both in Moscow and in Tabriz. I was vice counsel in Tabriz in 1954. Uh, it's not possible. <laughs> this, <clears throat> this is a question for uh, Ambassador Limbert. Uh, one of my uh, assignments was uh, working for the Fulbright program. For the Fulbright, Fulbright. Fulbright program. <clears throat> I, I had the, uh, the job of being the middleman between inviting Soviet scholars to come as lecturers 
uh, to American colleges and universities and finding uh, with the assistance of the embassy in Moscow, finding uh, um, uh, Americans who would go to lecture in Soviet universities. So even during the heights of the Cold War, we did maintain this exchange, and there were other exchanges also that are parallel with what uh, David and your colleague have said, exchanges uh, with, uh, with Iran. Uh, question is, Iran is not part of, doesn't uh, be part of the Fulbright program. Am I not being heard? No, we're being yeah. heard. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, what we're looking for ways of uh, bringing together uh, our two countries. Even though Iran is not involved with the Fulbright program, uh, what are the possibilities of an exchange program with Iranian scholars to come and lecture in American institutions and ours to return to lecture uh, in, in Iran. Yeah, we, we had talked about, could you create a yeah. sort of ersatz Fulbright program for the US and Iran yeah. without an embassy there? No, just, I mean, just very, very briefly, your, your example of the Soviet program, though, is a good one, because what it, what it tells you is, in the, I mean, in the 50s and the 60s, uh, polit relations were not good, but people kept at it. They didn't give up. <laughs> They did, and, and that's really the lesson that comes out of what we hear from our, for, uh, from, from our colleagues. Whether it's scholars, whether it's conferences, whether it's scientists, whether it's wrestlers, wrestlers or artists, whatever it, medical doctors, uh, technicians, whatever it, whatever it is, the lesson I think coming out of there is to, to keep at it and it's going to pay. It's going to pay off. Not tomorrow. Not next year. Maybe not three or four years. But it has a pay. It clearly has a payoff, and it clearly had a payoff. Going back to the negotiation of the JCPOA, the fact that Secretary, uh, Secretary Kerry and Secretary Muniz were able to talk to their colleagues directly um, in ways that perhaps others cannot. It's difficult to imagine the current Secretary of Energy, for example, uh, having the same kind of relationship with his Iranian counterpart, Professor Saleh. Uh, Maybe that's out there in the future, but I don't see it happening very soon. Could we have a scholarly exchange? I don't think well, we... Why not a, a sort of Erzatz Fulbright? Is it simply because do we need an interest section? Do we need people on the ground in Iran to identify? No. No. no, we don't. We can do a lot of these things. We, we talk about a virtual, we've talked about we having virtual. virtual embassies. We don't need people to actu uh, uh, actually to be there. The problem is, very, sim very simply, that many, as, as uh, I think many of you, any of you know, Jeff, Jeff you know this very well, um, Iran for a very long time and still is a four-letter word. <laughs> and anything to do with it um, is, is frankly toxic. And what the kind of work that David and Glenn and others have done is to work around that reality and to say, okay, that's a, re that's a, rea that's a reality. We have, but we're, we're still going to work it and it's not going, it's not going to be easy. So no, it's not a mechanical thing. It's not, it's not the, the, the fact of it. It's recognizing that this is a good, this is a good thing. This is some, this is, this is desirable to have these kinds of exchanges. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, come right there. Wait for the mic. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you to the panel again. Um, my name is Natalie Fuchs, and I work on space policy in the Middle East. I was, my question is twofold. I was wondering first if any of the panelists could speak specifically to um, space as a venue for engagement and collaboration, either in terms of space exploration or as an augmenting function for some of the ecological challenges, weather monitoring, things like that. And second, space inherently has some security risks uh, in it in terms of you know, military and the securitization or weaponization of space. I wonder if you could speak to how some of the programs uh, for, or exchanges 
Um, if they have security dimensions, how those are navigated, uh, if there are dual use technologies. Thank you. I can only talk to one program. Uh, UC Irvine has a program w involving Iranian uh, graduate students and postdocs using uh, satellite imagery for all sorts of environmental assessments. Mm -hmm. and, that's, uh, and that's supported out of a, a, a NASA facility, I think we're in North Carolina or somewhere. But there's a fellow named Sarush Sarushian, who is one of, uh, an Iranian American, who is a, one of our members of our academy who runs that program. And they do quite well in, uh, in not only in assessing water situation and so forth, but also in giving long-term predictions of, of, of weather. Mm -hmm. not, not, this is satellite, so it's a pretty long distance, you know. So yes, there is that program. There may be other ones, but that's the only one I know about. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that there are certain areas that are simply barred, though, to Probably. exchanges uh, involving, obviously, nuclear physics or, yeah, or uh, uh, missile technology, <laughs> that kind of thing. But, but the work is all done here, because I'm not aware of any capabilities in, in, in well, there are prob undoubtedly prob there are undoubtedly pro facilities in, in Iran because of all those set photo yeah. photographies available commercially. Yeah. yeah, but obviously, I mean, you don't, you don't work on, on topics. No, 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 that this are, is just reading off maps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. I'm, I'm told that if you look at the NASA phone book, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you might find might an answer some, to your question. You might find some Iranian names. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, one of the questions, the, the Jet, Jet Pro Propulsion Laboratory has outstanding Iranian Americans. <laughs> yeah. Yes, please. Uh, hello, I'm an exchange student from uh, Abu Dhabi. Oh, and, welcome. Uh, and relating to uh, the question with regards to space and security, I would also like to question, um, how do you analyze uh, security risks when it comes to space, uh, specifically in the Middle East? Uh, also, because <coughs> I believe there's been cooperation between the US government and the government of the UAE with regards to the rover being sent to Mars in Dubai. I don't know if you've heard of that. but. Not heard about it. Uh, yeah. So, just uh, security risks and space in the Middle East. Well, it depends even by security. Uh, if you're security can cover almost anything: population distribution, water flows. What, what do you mean by security? Uh, developing the ability to be send rockets into space. Oh, that, that's not in my. That's not in my wheelhouse. <laughs> it's not. Oh. That's not something we cooperate with Iran about. In fact, we're actively trying to prevent it through. Uh, through uh, arresting people who've sent uh, dual-use technology or missile-related technology to uh, Iran, putting new sanctions on companies in places like China that have yeah. provided such technology. So that's clearly outside the bounds of, of what we're talking about here today. Yes, over here. Yeah, uh, a question for Glenn and David. Uh, what areas are of scientific uh, collaboration are of most interest to uh, U.S. scientists you've talked with, and which ones are of most interest to Iranian scientists? If, you, if money were no object, what would be the areas of collaboration you'd put at the top of the list? Well, if you, if you include the OFAC, you almost throw out physics, chemistry, and biology, because they read dual-use technologies into those three areas. So the basic sciences, which are the strong point of our universities, <laughs> is almost off limits. Uh, so uh, the but beyond that, uh, which ones are, I think the, the, right now, the hottest item in, in, in Iranian science is nanotechnology. Hmm. For some reason, about uh, five years ago, the government decided we, were, we really want to move out in this area. It's largely but not exclusively in the medical related area, but across the board. Now, the extent to which you can stay away from security concerns I think that would be very high unless now, I think the Americans would be reluctant because they don't think Iran has anything to bring to the party. Uh, but they'd be surprised. Hmm. I, would, I would add that in Iran, environmental science dealing with wetlands challenges, sand and dust storms is a huge priority. You have perhaps a third of the country is subjected to almost existential threats because of the water problems and the dust, sand and dust storm problems. In, um, in Seistan, for example, because all the water was diverted from the Hamuns into what they call Chani Mays, which are reservoirs, the sand and dust storms are so bad that the people in the villages there 
they take what's called a das mal. Das mal is the sort of thing you put around your head. And they wet it and put it over their face at night. Otherwise, they don't wake up in the morning. And all the wild animals are dead. The, <coughs> the uh, dumb uh, domestic animals are, don't exist anymore. So this is a matter of huge concern. Uh, among other things, if you take populations from rural areas and they leave and go into the cities, now you've got a problem. Because the cities don't have enough jobs and they're not prepared for these, for these people. So it's, that's, and we in the United States, we know a lot about this because we made a lot of mistakes ourselves. This is a field in which I think a lot can be done. I think you agree, Glenn. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think one last question and then we will be done, so. Thank you. Very Best for last. Yes. <laughs> oh, pressure. Uh, so I wanted to follow up with Glenn on one point that he made in his report uh, about uh, State Department and National Academies began informal consultations, is how you phrased it, in 2016, on how to redirect um, weapons-oriented scientists there. Um, and uh, I think the government, U.S. government estimates had put the number in, in the thousands. Um, is this a role for the National Academies, and what is the current status of those discussions? Well, this was, of course, before the election. This was, this was, last, this was almost a year, over a year ago. And at that time, there was considerable interest in, in moving forward with Annex 3. And no, knowing about our experience in the, both in, in, uh, in Iran and in Russia, uh, we were invited to just have preliminary discussions about that. And, uh, and, and we, 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 they weren't, they were just asking for our opinion. <coughs> and so I, I went over a couple times and we discussed it. And uh, I tried to make the point that uh, don't try to send anybody to Iran unless you have the Iranian government's approval <laughs> and, and don't get anybody arrested. And, but, but take it seriously and, and anticipate that you will be dealing with people of comparable uh, capabilities. But since that time, since the, uh, I, uh, we, have not, we have not pushed it. Uh, and we have, heard, we have had uh, our conversations ended with the change, change in uh, government because uh, we didn't want to cause anybody difficulties. And we thought it was probably not, not appropriate. All right. Well, I want, to, I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank our speakers, uh, particularly Glenn. Fantastic yeah. work. Yeah. Uh, and this, uh, guy, this, this guy, too. And, and, and we appreciate all of your service in this area yeah. very, very much. So thank you again. And come on the 25th for our next, uh, our next event. I have a copy of the report for you. What was that?